Welcome back, CAD from Scratch, episode 15. The topic today is triangle intersections in three dimensions. And so this is an extremely important fundamental topic. It's the basis of almost everything of value in computational geometry. It's in CAD, obviously, rendering. It's used for collision detection. And even where it's not used, the geometric predicates or concepts that these algorithms are based on they apply. And just having watched this video, I think you'll not only have a better understanding of what's happening under the hood when you play certain games or make something in CAD, but you'll also have greater appreciation of how much goes into it. You know, it's not just simple, you know, dot products. There's quite a bit involved in the computations here. And it's surprising to me how few comprehensive resources there actually are on this topic, because honestly, there aren't any. And uh, it's not in any textbooks that I've seen. It's not in any MIT open courseware syllabus. Most of the papers, especially on quantification here, they're paywalled. Um, most of the open source code is you know, obfuscated or very hard to understand. There are a few really good papers um, that are sort of free to access uh, about classification, uh, especially a paper by Tomas Muller. I don't have it written down here. Um, and then the paper here by Olivier and Philippe. It's an awesome paper. They have a great, they have a really good, very efficient algorithm to classify intersections. Very, very good. But even their paper has a really bad typo that took me like honestly hours to figure out that it even was there. And it has a huge impact on how this works. So what I'm trying to say is that this video is a synthesis of like four or five hard to find, hard to understand resources plus some geometry and matrix algebra stuff of varying difficulties. So this video and the code to go along with it is definitely like a one of a kind resource that I, I genuinely hope is useful to at least one other person besides me. So without further ado, I'm gonna first talk about the math, the geometry, the algorithms. Then I'm, I'm not gonna do any live coding today like I usually do. There's just too much and I would make a hundred mistakes I have the code already written, which I'll just go through and show how we're implementing each of the algorithms. So let's begin. So when it comes to these intersections, you have to first classify it. So you have to see if for any two given triangles, if they A, don't intersect, if they're far apart, right? That's the most common case. B, then B, if they do intersect, for example, like shown here, the yellow and red triangles intersect in a single line segment in pink, or C, the absolutely the worst case, if they intersect in our coplanar. Um, that's, you know, you can imagine like triangles intersecting like this in, in this boundary here, that would be a coplanar intersection. That's the, the terrible case. Unfortunately though, it's a very common case, especially when you're working with, you know, primitives with flat faces like prisms, cubes, stuff like that, you know, and, and extrusions and stuff. You have this all the time and it's just a, an absolute mess if you can't do it properly. So that's the classification. After that, once you kind of determine what's going on in the triangles, you have to be able to figure out where it's going on. So where where does the injection occur? Where is this line segment? That's not as easy as it would sound. It's actually a lot harder than the classification. So we'll get into all this. So what is the fastest classification algorithm? Now, this may not be the fastest overall. It's the fastest one that I'm aware of. It has three different steps. So step A, is to check if the triangle bounding boxes overlap. This is how you can filter out, you know, the vast majority of faces that just don't intersect. So what is a triangle bounding box? A bounding box is basically the box that surrounds uh, the triangle and goes from the minimum to the maximum coordinate in the X, Y, and Z direction. And so basically, if you have two triangles with bounding boxes that don't even touch, then you can say for certain that they don't intersect. If the boxes do overlap, however, you may possibly have intersections for the triangles. Uh, phase step B, what are the signed distances from triangle one's vertices to triangle two's plane and vice versa? So basically we're trying to figure out if um, the distances from triangle one's plane to triangle two vertices and vice versa, if they're all positive or all negative, and I'll get into details later about what goes on for each of these. This is just me just talking sort of a top level uh, discussion right now. If they're all positive or all negative, there's no intersection. 
if they're all zero, obviously you have coplanar intersection. And now if some are positive and some are negative, that would mean that uh, triangle one vertices are split across the plane of triangle T2. In that case, you may have intersection. In that case, the third step, step C, applies. So that's basically if the triangle planes intersect along a line called line L, does the interval of intersection of triangle one and L overlap the interval of intersection of triangle two and L? If so, you definitely have intersection. If not, you do not have intersection. And these three steps are sort of set up in a way that you can filter out most of the cases with the least amount of operations. So you do A first, then B, and then C, because C is the most involved, B is the next most involved, and A is the easiest. So that, that's why you do A, B, and C in that order. And the, the, the benefit of what uh, Olivier and Philippe came up with in their paper is using a determinant, either a four by four determinant or a three by three reduction of that determinant to evaluate uh, something. So basically, you take this kind of weird triple product of some coordinates here, and it has a couple different uh, imp interpretations. So basically, this determinant here will evaluate to positive if the A2 vertex is above plane A1, B1, C1. It will evaluate negative if it's, ne if it's below the plane, and it will evaluate to zero if it's in plane. So you can imagine how that would be useful, for example, to figure out this step B, right? Because that's exactly how you would compute these quantities is with that determinant. So the other interpretation, which is harder to understand but equally relevant, is basically this determinant would be positive if the screw around ray A1 to B1 turns toward ray C1 to A to A2. Negative if it turns the other way, and zero again if you're coplanar and there's nothing to, to talk about. So if that doesn't make sense, don't worry. The first one should make sense. That's the one that's that matters more. This one is sort of the extra extra credit. If that would make sense, that's great as well. So for phase A, this is about the triangle bounding boxes overlapping. So basically, it's pretty simple. We will have to encode basically these uh, minimum maximum coordinates in X, Y, and Z for each triangle. We can save that in the same data structure that we use to encode the faces and their their own nodes and things like that. That'll be part of you know our our data structure. And basically, you can compute these six. Uh, expressions basically if any minimum value for a triangle exceeds the maximum value of the other triangles bounding box then you cannot have intersections only if all these tests fail then you can possibly have intersections and that's why you always want to do this test first because you can throw away 99 percent of all you know triangle intersection possible cases with this very simple test, if any one of these fails, you can immediately say no intersection. So it could be a single operation, it could be two, it could be three, whatever. You'll be very quickly, um, you'll very quickly be able to figure out if they intersect or not. So phase B, this one is the computation of the sine distances from triangle one to triangle two. So imagine you're looking down the edge of triangle one from its side. So it's just a single line like this. Basically, normal points out of that face. Now, if you have uh, triangle two vertices like this, where you may have two on the top, one on the bottom, or one on the top and two on the bottom, if that is the case, where you have some vertices above and some vertices below the plane of triangle T1, then you can possibly have intersection. But you can imagine if this vertex here was actually up here, and your triangle looked like this, then you you obviously could not have intersection because all the vertices are you know above triangle T1. So basically you can use those determinants here, y1, y2, and y3, to compute whether or not triangle uh, T2's vertices here, A2, B2, and C2, if they are above the plane defined by A1, B1, and C1. So if if y1, y2, and y3 have the same sign, there's no intersection. And if y1, y2, and y3 are all zero, that would mean that triangle T2 is sort of coincident, at least in the plane 
of triangle T1. So they would be coplanar. So after that, if neither of those two is uh, is is been evaluated as true, then look at y4, y5, and 6. So y4, 5, and 6 are basically the opposite. So this is triangle T1's vertices, A1, B1, and C1, relative to the plane A2, B2, C2, which is triangle 2's plane. So you can evaluate that again. So if y4, 5, and 6 have the same sign, then you have no intersection. And if y4, 5, and 6 are 0, again, you're coplanar. But this would already be true. You would have already evaluated this. So this is not even important to keep as a, as a possible test. You can keep it if you'd like, but it will always evaluate here, not here. And of course you can't use zero, you have to use a tolerance because you can't use like, you know, exactly zero in um, computing like this, but some small tolerance would be fine. Now, finally is phase C. This is like the, the real last chance for intersection to occur between triangles, at least in the general sense, not in a coplanar sense. So basically, is it's asking, do the intersection intervals overlap? So what does that mean? So triangle one here is in is in teal, and triangle two here is in green. And the plane of triangle T1 and T2 intersects in this line L in pink. Now, where triangle T1 intersects L, which is guaranteed to do because it's defined by the plane of triangle T1 and T2. So where T1 crosses line L, you have some interval here shown in this pink color, salmon color. And where triangle T2 crosses L, you have this interval in this salmon color. And if those two intervals overlap, then you have intersection, guaranteed. That's the final test. However, if you can imagine triangle T2 was over here, and the interval for intersection was you know, over here, then you can say that this interval on T2 does not overlap this long interval on T1, and therefore the triangles do not intersect. Does that make sense? It should. So basically, if you kind of can um, set it up like this, it will make computational sense. So if you can call the lone vertex from triangle T1 on its own side of the plane of triangle T2, A1, so basically what I'm saying is, if you have this view here from the side of triangle T1, this here would be point A2. And then in the opposite case where this is green and this one is blue, this point would be triangle A1. The, the lone vertex is called A. If you call it A, A1 and A2 respectively, then you can evaluate intersections of these sort of line segments with line L. So for example, where, where A1, B1, crosses line L, that is point I. And where A1, C1 crosses L, that is point J. A2, B2, that's point K. A2, C2, that's point L. And remember, uh, L is oriented, obviously, to N1 cross N2, N1 being normal of triangle T1, N2 being normal of triangle T2. So basically, the way this works is you do a simple min-max evaluation and if that min-max evaluation uh, evaluates a certain way, you can say that intersection occurs or not because the intervals overlap or do not. So in this case, you're looking if the minimum value from sort of, you know, in this sense, looking from this point in pink here outwards along line L, is the minimum of IJ less than the maximum of LK? And is the minimum of LK less than the maximum of IJ? If those both are true, you're guaranteeing that the intervals overlap. If they're not, then you can possibly have the intervals not overlapping. Or I mean, you do have it not overlapping. So you must have this been max evaluated in this way for there to be guaranteed intersection. And lucky for us, this equates to evaluating these two determinants. So computing these ones in the way I said before, if these are both less than or equal to zero, you have intersection. So basically, with a very little number of operations, we can determine if triangles intersect, especially on average, when you consider the fact that we're throwing away almost all of the possible intersection cases in the first phase of the algorithm, and then even more in the second phase of the algorithm, you know, it's very efficient on average for us to evaluate whether or not faces intersect. Because if you can imagine, we have 
you may have a model with thousands and thousands and thousands or even millions of triangular faces. You want to have this be very efficient in terms of number of operations. Now, here's one more thing. If you evaluate these two more determinants, you can classify that intersection interval even further. So basically, the, the point is, you want to be able to evaluate what is the sequence of i, j, l, and k. Because you can imagine, you know, if, if l, k is located over here, it's a different intersection than where if it was over here, or where it is originally. Or what if LK was this big and IJ was smaller? You know, there's plenty of options for intersection intervals here. So basically, if you evaluate Y9 and Y10, which are uh, similar, oh crap, I made a mistake. Hold on, I'll fix that. No, I didn't. Am I crazy? No, I didn't. I'm just dyslexic. Never mind, it's fine. So. Basically, if uh, you have these combinations of Y10 and Y9, you can get the actual sequence of the points of intersection along line L. Now, why does that matter? That matters because on both triangles, the actual intersection slice, sort of, if I go back to the very top, this, this slice here will always occur on both triangles between the center of those two vertices. Uh, so the, the, these two vertices here in the middle. So in this case, it would be ij. In this case, it would be kj. In this case, it would be kl. In this case, it would be il. So basically, if you can figure out what i and j are, you can figure out exactly where the intersection occurs. If y, 10, and 9 are both you know, in, this, in this condition here. That's the plan of attack for the actual quantification of where these lines of intersection between triangles occur. We'll leave that for a second now. We'll go on to the actual calculations now. So if you want to calculate the points of intersections of, uh, you know, on line L, the first step is obviously to find line L of planar intersection. So if you have, you know, triangle T2 and T1 with their own normals, and then you have plane P2 and P1, they intersect along line L. So line L has this form. It is... Uh, P0, which is, you know, at some point on this line, plus N1 cross N2, that's the direction, times parameter T. So what is P0? That's actually not very easy to find. And in fact, <laughs> this you'll see this is very uh, complicated. But basically, you, you obviously have equations for plane 1 and plane 2 because you have the normals and you have plenty of vertices on each face, right? You have three vertices for each triangle, so you can take your pick for P1 and P2. And this just gives you the equation for the plane. Obviously, n1x, n1y, n1z are the normalized. That's very important. You have to have normalized values for this. Uh, these are the coordinates for the normal in uh, for plane 1. And for n2, that's for plane 2. Now, the third plane equation is basically arbitrary. We're defining a plane passing through any vertex that we know about, it could be on triangle one, it could be on triangle two, it doesn't really matter, but just some point that we know. And then uh, it has the the L direction as its normal. So basically, uh, it's this plane equation here. So you have the X, Y, and Z components. Again, it should be normalized. And you're taking any point anywhere on any of the triangles as the point you're passing through. With those, you can make a very simple system of equations. And honestly, you can just solve this with an, an inversion. But remember, we're doing things efficiently because we want to be able to evaluate things, these things very quickly for many, many thousands of, of Canada intersections um, once we have you know, down-selected them to, our, to which ones are intersections. We have to evaluate all of them as quickly as possible. So you don't want to be able, you don't have to invert matrices if you don't have to. That's a very intensive operation. So there's actually a clever way to solve this. But basically, if you solve this system of equations, you will solve x, y, and z for p0. And remember, p0 is a point that we need in order to quantify line L. So we, this is the trick. You can recall that row 1 and row 3 are perpendicular because, remember, n3 is, is the cross product of n1 and n2. So you know for a fact that n3 is perpendicular to both n1 and n2. And 
so basically, if we can just make rows one and two orthogonal, like rows one and three and two and three are, the equation is already solved. Because once you have an orthogonal matrix, or I guess in our case, an, an orthonormal matrix or whatever you call it, the, the, the solution just falls out, remember? Because when you have an orthonormal matrix, the transpose is the inverse. And then you can evaluate this entire expression as simply a matrix multiplication, right? Three by three matrix by three by one matrix that will give you X, Y, and Z. So if we can basically pull out the N2 component from uh, this first row, we basically solve the problem. So that row operation is basically shown here. So you're taking row one, subtracting out the n1.n2, so the n2 component in the direction of n1 of row two and storing that in row one. So basically you're just subtracting out the, like I said, the n2 component of n1 uh, and then you're renormalizing it. It's very important to renormalize because you have to have an orthonormal matrix for the transpose to be the inverse, I, I believe. And so you have something like this. When two do those operations, you'll have uh, the same row two and row three as before, but your row one will be very different. E has this form, just the magnitude um, for normalization. But here is very interesting that you don't have to actually evaluate the square root because when we solve the equation later on, you'll have E times E, so the square root will cancel out. But that's sort of not either here nor there. You'll also have this revised right-hand side vector D. So you'll have the same row two and three, but you have a different row one. And so your original matrix will look like this, So, but, but now, with your orthonormal matrix A, you can take the transpose and pre-multiply uh, both sides, and then you can evaluate P0 very simply like this. So AT transpose times D, that will exactly give you P0, and once you have P0, you can fully define line L. So basically now you have a closed form expression for a point on line L. And with that, you have line L, and that's one of the hardest parts of solving the intersection problem. And you did it, with a single matrix inversion, which is very, very nice. Now step two, once you have line L quantified like we do, you want to find the intersection of T1 and T2 on line L. That's the intervals here, IJ and, and KL. So you're basically evaluating four things, but really only two, like I said before, because you only care about the center two of these uh, Evaluation. So here you care about K and L. So you want you want of these four, two of them. So I is the intersection of A1, B1 with L, and so on. So to solve for I, again, it's very simple. So we have a couple things. So you have to have the equation of A1, B1. So you can parametrize this vector equation like this. So this is the A1 uh, sort of coordinates in X, Y, and Z. And this is the vector from A1 to B1 times parameter T. And this is the, the equation we have for line L. So we have P0, we have N3, and U is the parameter. So at the intersection, obviously, L equals A1, B1. Those two equal each other. And so you can solve this equation. You have three equations because you have three components, X, Y, and Z. And you have two unknowns, T and U. So it's an overdefined or whatever they call it uh, system. And so there's different ways you can solve it. You have, you know, three different combinations of um, substitutions to solve this, this system, right? And so you can go about that. At the end of the day, here is one possible case. If you took the X and Y equations and, and, and solved the two of them, you'd have this expression for T from the X and Y coordinates. It looks like this. However, whenever you see a denominator in any sort of mathematical expression that you're using on a computer, you should always question when will this be zero? Because this will be zero, you know, quite frequently if you have, um, you know, uh, primitives that are oriented along, you know, x, y, and z axes. Because if a1, b1 is parallel with z, this evaluates to zero, right? And also in some combinations of n3 and a1 and b1, you'll also have this to be zero. But you can't account for those beforehand, those are going to be flukes, right? So basically what you do is you can calculate not only t from x and y equations, but you can also calculate t from the x and z equations and the z and y equations. And then what you do is you don't, you don't solve the t values. You, you, calculate the dominant, d, you calculate the denominator values first, <laughs> sorry. So basically 
you pick whichever value, whichever t, so txy, txz, or tzy, you pick whichever t has the greatest value of the denominator. If you do that, or sorry, I should say denominator magnitude. If you pick the, the t equation with the greatest denominator magnitude, you will guarantee yourself that you're not going to have a zero in the denominator because zero is not a very high magnitude. And also you'll have a very good computational um, accuracy because you want to have a large denominator when you do when you do divisions because that just gives you more accurate results, you know, in in, in general. So you'll, you'll you'll pick you'll force divide with the denominators here. So uh, denominator x y, denominator x z, denominator z y, and see which is largest. And then whichever is largest, you'll evaluate the numerator and evaluate the total expression for t. And once you have t, you're basically done because once you have t, you can solve for point i at x y and z from the original equation that we had here, right? And once you have i, you know, you can calculate l, k, and j in the same way, and then you can precisely describe where the intersection occurs. So you repeat that process for j, k, and l as you need. Remember, you only need the middle two of those, uh, those points. And at that point, you can precisely quantify the region of intersection for any non-coplanar triangles. End of story. Now, how do you detect overlapping coplanar triangles in 3D? This is what I hate, and you will hate this too. And I you know, <laughs> identify with, with hating coplanar triangles. I really hate it. So basically, the first thing you do, as before, is you check if the bounding boxes overlap. It's very simple. If they do, you go on. Now, here's the process. The first thing you do is you test if any of triangle 1's edges cross any of triangle two's edges. And there might be better ways to do this, but this is a very simple one to understand. And I think it's it's pretty quick. I'm not sure if a faster one exists. I think possibly Olivier and Philippe have a better one, but it's just too hard for me to explain in a video like this. So, but this, this is comparable, you know, very, very closely comparable. So you test if any edges cross, then if no edges cross, you test if a single point in T2 lies in T1. Why do you do that? Well, here's the reason why. So let's say T1 is like this, and T2 is like this. Well, then no edge is intersected, but still they overlap. Why? Because one of these vertices is inside this triangle. So you test both if any of the vertices in T1 are in T2 and vice versa. If any of those things evaluate to true, you have some kind of intersection between the triangles in the plane. So here's a, here's a very simple way to calculate whether or not line segments intersect. And this is very, very clever. So basically the way you do this is, let me change my color really quick. Take, you have to satisfy these two sort of dot products of cross products. So let me explain how they work. So let's look at A1, B1, cross B1, B2. So A1, B1, B1, B2 is basically saying this. This sort of curl. If So basically, the, if you were to have the right hand rule, so you put your right hand on the screen, if A1, B1, B2, that points out of the page, right? And then it checks A1, B1, A2. So this right hand rule that points into the page. So basically, if out of the page times into the page, that will give you less than zero, right? Because it would be, you know, if you dot them, you'll have a negative number, right? Because they're in opposite directions. So if that's the case for both this, this direction and this direction, you are guaranteed to have intersection. You basically want to, you're basically asking yourself, does A2B2 cross over A1B1 in the sense that a uh, sort of right hand rule would indicate that for both A1B1 and A2B2? But here's an example of that not being the case. So, as before, this and this are opposite directions of, of right hand rule curl. However, this, oh, let me change colors. This and 
this are the same direction of right hand curl. So this lower expression evaluates to false and then you do not have intersections of these line segments. So basically this is a very efficient way to evaluate whether or not line segments intersect and you will repeat this for three times three possibilities for any of T1 edges crossing triangle T2, right? And then if, if any of them do, you can immediately stop calculating. You can say, yes, we have intersection. The classification is done. We do have intersection. Now, the last two things there was checking if triangle T1's nodes are in triangle T2 boundaries and vice versa. And like before, we can evaluate this um, type of expression here. You have a normal for triangle T1. You can take um, that, cross it with the sides to evaluate the side normals, N1, N2, and N3, as shown here. And then you can calculate the dot product of the sides with uh, these normals. Sorry, I should, should say not the sides, but the 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 vectors from the vertices to the point of interest, like this, this, and this. If those dotted with the normals are all the same sign, then the point is inside triangle T1. If any of them are different signs, it's not. And I should say, if if you have some zeros in there, it may be fine depending on how you want to count intersections or not, because if you have two of the same sign and one zero, that means that triangle A2 would be on an edge, like, like here, for example. And if you had two zeros, that would mean that you're on a vertex, like C1 there. Now, you may look at this and see a difference from previous videos. So in previous videos, I actually had six equations to evaluate. That was just so I could make things very simple for people to understand. When we have to do things efficiently, I don't want to do any extraneous calculations, so I'm only going to take three, um, three dot products here to evaluate whether or not we're inside the triangle or not. Now, how can you ca now once we've classified intersections of, of coplanar triangles, the question is how can you calculate the vertices of that overlap zone? So here are two planar triangles, and you have an overlap zone here between I, J, and A2. So these overlap zones are defined by a series of points, right? Here the points are I, J, and A2, but these points are basically generated by any time a line segment on triangle T2 crosses a line segment on triangle T1, and any time you have a point inside, anytime you have a, a, a node from one triangle inside the other. If you take all those points, that entire point set, that defines this boundary zone here. So it's very simple. It, it's, it's actually very simple to understand, but it's kind of hard to implement. You're just going to be computing, making a, a huge list of uh, all the points on this sort of uh, overlap polygon. And you'll get, like I said before, points from intersections of line segments and then points from contained nodes like A2 here. So again, um, I and J are computed as the intersection of line segments. So here is an example for I. And this should be deja vu because we did this just a few minutes ago. You have an equation for line, uh, I guess, P2 here and the equation for line uh, P1 here. So you, it starts at A2 and it goes in this direction times parameter T and times parameter U. And where P2 equals P1, you have intersection at point I. Uh, so basically, um, we have a similar sort of a, um, T value as before. We're going to have three candidate T's. So we have TXY, TXZ, and TYX. And again, you want to evaluate the denominator first and see whichever denominator has the maximum magnitude and use that denominator and that numerator for calculation of T. And once you have T, you can compute the point of intersection very easily. And I should say, by the way, when you have an expression like this for you know anything, if the t value is less than zero or greater than one, the point of intersection of this line is not on the boundary that you said, because this is normalized so that zero basically means a2 and one means b2. So if you have any point that's less than zero or more than one, you will not be on sort of the line segment part of this line. 
And so at this point, you're pretty much an expert in intersections of triangles. I mean, that's the that's the entire master class on intersections. But there's one last thing <laughs> that we have to talk about. Because if you recall, we have this point set here, I, J, and A2. And when you have only three, it's not a problem. But when you have four, five, six, how do you know that these points are in the correct order? Because the order matters when you're talking about the polygon, right? And so basically, I want to compute the vertex order for convex polygons. So once you find the vertices of the polygonal overlap zone for these coplanar triangles, you have to put them in a sequence. So here you have, you know, four points of interest, they would be in like a rhombus shape here, you have you know, two triangles making a triangle shape here, you have two more in a triangle shape, here you have, you know, uh, a hexagon shape. And so there's different options. And how do you know that these six vertices go in a certain order? You have to compute that, right? You can't just guess. Now, there are, there are ways to apply the previous sort of um, intersection tests that you get these in this order automatically, but they're honestly way too hard. And we can do this sort of ourselves in a very simple way. So basically, if that overlap zone has more than three vertices, you have to define a sequence for them. Because like I said before, there's a difference between, here you can see this um, rhombus shape, A, B, C, D. This rhombus shape, A, C, D, B, has the same vertices, just in a different order. These three are sort of rotated around. It gives you a, you know, degenerate quadrilateral. It's not even a real shape. You know, it's, it's self-intersecting, so it doesn't work. It's, it's also inaccurate because your region intersection was like this, right? So having these intersections is just, just blatantly inaccurate. So when it comes down to quads, it's actually not that hard. There's a sort of um, method you can use. So basically you have to ask, do the diagonals intersect? So does the first and third vertex, or sorry, does the first and third vertex combined into a diagonal cross over the second and fourth? If it does, you're fine. Your ordering is fine. If the first and the third, so A to D, and B to C, second to fourth, if they don't cross, the signs don't, don't cross, then what you have to do is you have to swap the first and the, four, the fourth vertex, vertices. Here you'll swap A1 and B1, and then you can, you can imagine swapping these two would basically reduce you to this, right? So that's the process for quadrilaterals. Unfortunately, for pentagons and hexagons, you have to sort their points by the 3D angle about a normal vector at the center of that polygon. That's the simplest way to understand how this works. So let's say you had a, a pentagon like this. You have a center point that you could compute as the average of these sort of five points. And then you compute the angle from this, this line here, A to center, of everything else. So A sort of A center B, A center C, A center D, A center E. Compute all those angles. And you compute those in a very simple way. We did this in one of the first videos. And this is very, very, it's actually, it's simple, but almost no one knows this. Because when people talk about angles, they don't care about negatives. But in when it comes to this computational geometry stuff, we really care about negatives a lot. Because, you know, this angle and this angle, you know, if you do it with stupid arc cosine, like most people do, like the dot product rule, they'll both be positive angles. What we want, though, is we want this angle to be, you know, this, AB to be this, and you want AE to be this, or this. But this would be negative, right? So you want to be able to evaluate all those things. And so the process here is taking the uh, arctangent 2, that's a special kind of arctangent, um, of this determinant and a dot product. So it defined vectors V1 and V2 as sort of this vector and this vector and n as the unit normal, very important, has to be a unit normal out of the plane here, so that's defined like n. The dot product is simply uh, v1 dot v2, and the, de the determinant is n dot v1 cross v2. If you have these two, you can evaluate this angle for these, you know, all of the possible angles. So you can compute the angle here, compute the angle here, compute the angle here, compute the angle here, every single angle you can, can compute. 
Of course, obviously, the angle from A in the center to A will be zero, but all the rest are going to be, in general, you know, not known. And then all you have to do is sort them in an ascending order. If you sort these angles in ascending order and the points that go along with it in ascending order, then you're guaranteed to have a right-handed, I guess, counterclockwise sequence of your polygon vertices. This is this is big stuff. You, I mean, this is not easily understood, not easily graspable. You, you have to be able to do this to be able to, to orient your vertex set in a way that gives you a convex polygon that you can use for other things that you may want to use for your uh, your algorithm going forward. So we're going to use this stuff for um, computational solid geometry. We're going to triangulate this, this polygon in other ways. And it's very important for us to know exactly what this polygon looks like for the next uh, one or two videos in this series. So that's very, very important. And that wraps up all the theory that goes into 3D triangle intersections. So that's been 41 minutes. I'm going to take a break and then I go through the code. I'll see you in a second. Okay, welcome back. So the, the first thing we have to do for our algorithm is add a couple things to our structures here. So for, um, in order to basically encode this bounding box. So I want to be able to encode the minimum and maximum X, Y, and Z values for everything. So I put here, let me zoom in a little bit. Um, this is our structures for our, you know, geometry stuff for the edges, for the faces, and for the bodies, I put these floats here. These quantify the minimum maximum values for the bounding box uh, around the, the objects. And of course, we had to change the constructors for these things, which I did in order to put these things in place. But it's very simple, I'm not gonna go into that. The next thing here is these, uh, let me go to the um, actual geometry.c file. And so, I'll explain every algorithm that I implemented here in, in order because it's kind of uh, easiest to do that way. So let's talk about this first. So these are two very short functions. One, is, one says rotate face nodes. One says swap face nodes. These basically sw rotate nodes on a face or swap nodes on a face. And so why would you do that? Well, this is why. If you recall, when we tried to determine if the intersection intervals overlapped, we basically said that we had to have A1 be the lone vertex on its side of T2 and, uh, and vice versa, A2 being on its own side of T1. To do that, you have to be able to, to circularly rotate A, B, C on both triangles. So this simply does that. And then swapping. Swapping basically guarantees that you are keeping your vertex on the same, what's it called, like a, the positive subspace of the others of of the other plane so basically whenever you have a rotation and you change the the whenever you want to swap the face nodes to preserve your orientation of your face you can use this function here so next we have this function here edge edge intersection this basically determines if uh two line segments a1 b1 and a2 b2 cross and we use this a couple times if you remember um where, 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 here. Yeah. And also we used it down, uh, down here. So basically this, this determines if they intersect and also it gives you, uh, where they intersect. So it will tell you this intersection point I here in terms of an, an out, output coordinate. And it just implements what I just told you about here, this uh, TIJ. So basically it computes these cross products here uh, and dot product part them together. That, that's what I said before, that's the, um, this. If those are satisfied, it basically goes on and it computes the denominators. It picks the largest denominator, evaluates the corresponding T value. And with that corresponding T value, um, we can compute the I value here and return it. Very simple. Next, equation, next uh, function we have is edge line intersection. This is a very similar, it just evaluates where A1, B1 crosses a line, a given line through P0 in direction N3. We use that um, to compute this. Basically where, where A1, B1 crosses L 
And it's the same exact thing, pretty much, just a slightly different expression for t. And again, we divide with the denominators, pick the largest denominator, magnitude, evaluate t, make sure it's between zero and one. If it's not, it doesn't intersect. If it does, we evaluate where it does and we return one, very simple. Now, next is a function called coplanar node within triangle. This evaluates our you know, tried and true method of determining if triangle uh, node is in another triangle in this way. We've done it a thousand times before, I'm not gonna go over it again. Um, then this, is the talk the, the part I talked about at the very end? Uh, it's a function called reorder points. This basically implements what I mentioned uh, down here. So what it does is it uh, for the special case of a quadrilateral, it does what I said. It evaluates if the diagonals are crossing in in this way. You can take a look in the code if you'd like. It evaluates the cross products. It takes the dot products of them and evaluates if they're uh, if they're both less than zero. If yes. Um, they cross and it's a good order. If not, we change them around. Now for pentagons and hexagons, it's much more difficult and much more operations involved. So we're doing this. First thing we do is we evaluate the center point of all the points in our point set, A, B, C, D, and E. We calculate that like this. Of course, we have a division. Divisions are not very good, um, but you have to do what you have to do sometimes. Um, now we're taking the normal. We use that normal and the uh, points A and center here to compute the angles, as I mentioned down here. And the function for that is in our trigonometry.c file here. So I these are we had we had this one before get node angle. I added get point angle because it doesn't involve nodes; it involves just generic points in space. Uh, but it's pretty much the same operation here. This is how we calculate the angle in 3D space. This is the best way to do so. Keep you know keep this in the back of your mind for everything in your life. This is an extremely important equation. Now, once we calculate um, uh, that that angle, we basically do an insertion insertion sort by that angle, and we use the insertion sort algorithm to rearrange not just the angle list but also the point list in ascending order, as I mentioned. You can look up an insertion sort. I'm not going to talk about that. It's not in the scope of this discussion. Now, here are sort of the the, the, the big um, the big functions. So, I have one function that basically does this, and one function that does this based off of this. So, this is called uh, classified triangle intersect. This takes in simply two faces, triangular faces. And it will return these values. It'll return negative one if some kind of error. Return zero if they don't, don't cross. That's this. It will return one if they inter intersect in a line. Um, in this form, so this sequence of k, i, j, and l returns two in this form, three in this form, four in this form. And it returns five if they're coplanar. Very simple. And the way it does that, well, uh, first things first. I set a tolerance. Remember, we have to use a tolerance not zero because you know things may not be exactly zero when you do floating point arithmetic. So you have to use some small number. It could be smaller than this. That's probably too large of a tolerance, but whatever. Um, if we have more than three nodes per triangle, we say that's bogus. Now, the first thing for our algorithm is we check if the bounding boxes overlap. So we're evaluating if the minimum values exceed the maximum values. If they do, then there's no overlap, uh, no intersection, if any of them do. And I think, I'm not sure what the compiler does. I'm pretty sure if you wanted to, you could break this up into like six different operations and you know maybe save some operations here. But I'm pretty sure if you do an optimizing um, step for your compiler, I, I, I think it will just automatically do that. It will automatically break out if one of these is uh, satisfied. The next step is we're evaluating, um, let me scroll down a little bit. So we, we did phase phase A. Phase B, we're evaluating Y1, 2, and 3. That computes whether or not triangle T diversities are all above, below, or in the same plane, or crossing the plane of triangle T1. Um, if they're all the same sign, no intersection is possible. If they're all within the tolerance, uh, then you have a coplanar case. 
I'll come back to this in a second. Um, and then if it's four, five, and six, you can check those as well. If they're all positive, you have an intersection. If they're all zero, which I commented out because you don't need, um, you have a coplanar solution. Uh, then what we do is we we rotate, like I said before, we rotate around um, these vertices, A1, B1, C1, and A2, B2, C2, to make sure that only the zeroth node is on that side of the other triangle's plane. Very simple. And then we evaluate some determinants here um, to, to do that. Finally, we talk about um, Y7, Y8, 9, and 10. These are used, so Y7 and 8 are used to compute if we have intersection at all. So if we have an overlap of our interval intersection, if they're both less than zero, we do. And then we can check nine and 10. And if they're different sort of combinations, we have different return values, one, two, three, and four. Again, they correspond with different sequences of um, those points, K, I, J, and L on the interval of line uh, L here. So um, going back up, now if it was coplanar, here, if it's coplanar, we do some of the analysis we talked about down here. Where is it? Here. So we, we first, um, we loop over all edges of phase one to see if any of them cross phase two edges. If, they, if any of them cross, we have intersections, so we return five, which means coplanar. Then we check if any, if a single node, in this case, node zero on phase one is inside phase two. If it is, we return five for coplanar. Then we check vice, the opposite. If a single node of phase two is, in tri is inside triangle phase one, if yes, return five. If not, they're coplanar, but they don't intersect, which is the best case for coplanar <laughs> triangles. Um, so that's that wraps up the classification step. So now we've, we've basically evaluated how the triangles cross, if they do. They either don't cross, they cross in one of four ways of a line segment, or they cross in some kind of polygon, yeah? At this point, I have a, a final function here, which is triangle intersection points. This computes the points of intersection. So for this, it would compute this point and this point. For this case, it would compute this point, this point, and this point, right? It would compute all the points required uh, for intersection of, of, of the two triangles. So the first thing is, is it, it calculates the mode. Remember, it, it calculates the classification. So it runs this first between phase one and phase two. If the mode is not zero, because if it's zero, there's no intersection. If it's between zero and five, and you have a line segment like this, oops, like this. I should say like this. Oops, <laughs> I hope it didn't break anything. I hate that. Okay. So uh, basically, if we have a line segment intersection, we can compute how it intersects. So in that case, we're basically doing um, this. So the first thing we do is we compute um, everything we do is to basically compute these plane these planes. So you want to be able to evaluate this expression here, a transpose times d. So we just basically do that. It's not really that hard. Um, after that, we have we have basically solved for p0. That's I call it p3 in the code. Um, and then we look at the four different modes. So the modes being, um, where is it? Yeah, these, these four modes here, one, two, th one, two, three, four, whatever order it happens to be. Based off whatever mode we have, so intersection sort of sequence, we compute the two middle uh, points. So here KJ, here KL, here IL, here IJ. We compute those two and we print them out. Very simple. Then um, that, that, that wraps up the line segment intersection, so modes one through four. If mode is five, um, here it says, I should say equal, equal five, not So basically, if they're coplanars and they intersect, we have to do what we talked about down here. Where? Here. So we have to compute all these vertices. So the first thing we do is we 
check, we, we look through all the edges in, uh, in I guess, triangle one here. We check if the, we first check if the pth node of T1 is inside T2, and the pth node of T2 is inside T1, typo. Let me fix that before I forget. And then we check if the pth edge crosses the qth edge of T2. So we look through both T1 and T2 edges and see if any of them cross. If they do, we add them to a list of intersection points here, and we increment the number of points in our list. And then lastly, if the number of points exceeds three, that is if we have you know, something like this, like, like this case or this case, then we must make sure that this sequence is a, you know, a convex, not self-intersecting polygon. And for that, we have the function reorder points I talked about before that does the, you know, whole insertion short thing with the, with the angles. Um, and then it prints it out. So if I, uh, if I compile that and I run it, oh, sorry, let me show you the, the main thing first. Oops, my V. So what I did was I um, defined four triangles here. Don't worry what they are, I'll, I'll show you that in a second, but there's four triangles um, with different coordinates. And I made them so they intersect in different ways. So just to test out different parts of this code. So what I do is I first, I classify them just to see what the classification returns. And then if it returns a number that's not zero, so if it returns intersection, then it computes the points of intersection and it will print them to the screen. So very simple. So if I recompile it, rerun it, we have these results. So don't worry about them. Um, basically, this just shows you that the, the functions work as intended. I will show you a graphic about how this looks right now. So um, it's not going to be in the code, but it's in octave. So I made another function here um, in uh, just in terms of octave or MATLAB code here with all those points. So these are the four triangles, one, two, three, and four. These are where our code calculates they intersect. And then just plots some figures and it waits for us to hit enter between the two. So let me show you how this looks. So octave, let me send this to the other screen first. So here is the first two triangles. So these two are not coplanar. These are just in just general intersection. So the blue triangle is T1, red triangle is T2, and the yellow line there is the intersection interval. You can see that it crosses exactly between the two. So this test case works. Hit enter. Second test case is right here. These are two coplanar triangles crossing in this way. And you can see the red triangle, blue triangle, and the yellow triangle. Yellow triangle is the intersection of red triangle and the blue triangle. Right? That seems to work. Next, here's that Star David thing. So there's two triangles here crossing in a hexagon place, a hexagon sort of uh, sequence. And again, this tests two things. It tests can we compute the intersection points, but it also tests if we can, you know, reorder them in a way that puts them in a, uh, you know, clockwise right hand rule sequence. And it does. So the red triangle, you know, crossing over the blue triangle gives us this yellow hexagon, and everything seems to work just fine. So that's it. I hope you really enjoyed this video. I hope that one or two people learned something. It was a very long video. It's almost an hour now. So if you did, that's awesome. If you didn't, that's awesome too. Either way, have a great day.